too. So uh, Matt made it in from uh, around Pitzer's Chapel Road. I traversed from Frederick County, Maryland this morning. And our next guest has worked her way up I-81 from Winchester, Virginia, and arrived safely. Maggie, good morning to you. Hey, good morning. How are you? Excellent. Thank you. Appreciate you making it in today. Thank you. It was a little bit of a scary drive, but... <laughs> yeah, give, give us the play-by-play. Play. How, how, how is it looking? What lanes are good? What lanes aren't? Uh, you know, that far left lane when you pass uh, Tabler Station Road, you know, that third lane as it the interstate opens up, that is just a big sloppy kind of icy mess. So really, you're just kind of relegated to two lanes. And I was out there in my husband's pickup truck because it has four-wheel drive, but everybody else was in tractor trailers. <laughs> yes. And not many people on the interstate, which I was very grateful for because, you know, not everybody knows how to drive in the snow. I'm not as experienced, even though I've lived in West Virginia and here recently in Winchester, but I work here in, Winch in West Virginia. Um, <clears throat> it's been a while since we've had sure. any kind of yeah. little weather event like this, snow and ice, and mm -hmm. the fact that it's 27 degrees mm -hmm. outside is just... Yeah, it's, it's an icy mess. Not going to warm up much. No. No. I think we go above freezing by one degree tomorrow or the day after the 33. Then the rest Ooh. of the week, the high is below yeah. freezing. Right, right. You have to wait until you get to next Monday. We're supposed to get more snow Friday. How much, I don't know. But right. Thursday night into Friday, Ugh. more measurable snow is supposed to hit us. Isn't the perspective amazing, right? You know, we're talking about this, and we've got a few inches on the ground, and there was how many thousands of people watching the Bills and the Steelers yesterday up in Orchard Park, and they had over oh. a foot of snow, and they're like, we're, we're going to the game. You know? oh, yeah. It's they just amazing. nearly four feet fell yeah. near oh. the stadium. It, it was Park. crazy, and every time they scored a touchdown, they were throwing big yes. puffs of snow up in the air. It was like <laughs> snow fireworks. Which, yes. which was It was really kind of cool. And and watching it on TV. I don't think it'd have been fun being there, but no, they know how to dress though. Yes. They, they've got all the good gear. Um, they all look like know. the Michelin man. <laughs> yes, the game, they sure right? did. Did you see the video of your Steelers fans at all, Rob? Yes. Um, the, the, some videos showing how fans had to get to their seats and it looked like a dad, his wife and son. And he's basically being the snow plow, just yes. trudging. Mm -hmm. Cause the seats weren't, the bills offered people $20 an hour, which yeah. is nowhere near enough money to make your way to the stadium with that weather. And then shovel <laughs> shovel out the stadium. And then the issue is, where do you put the snow once you mm -hmm. dig it out of your seat? Well, you put it on the next guy's seat. Oh, yeah. They right? just yeah. had mountains of snow. Can you imagine being outside and not sheltered and nope. homeless? No. Nope. Yeah. No. It's pretty sad. Um, uh, by I, the way, I mean, formally introduce you. Maggie oh. Garrito Cortez from Telemon mm -hmm. is our guest for those of you on the radio who are not seeing the video feed on TV 10 or Facebook where the title is there. Go right Oh, there. okay. Yeah, yeah I, uh, I work for Telemon. I'm the housing program coordinator there. And I thought I'd just stop by and talk a little bit about um, the what's called the point in time count, which is where um, the, the uh, we count how many folks are sheltered or unsheltered. Well, unsheltered, when I say sheltered, meaning in a, in a um, homeless shelter. Mm -hmm. Um, as I came in this morning, I came in off of Warm Springs Avenue and then onto Meadow Lane. And right there on the corner of Meadow Lane and 9 um, or 11 was um, a gentleman with a sign that said, I'm homeless. He had yep. a couple sweatshirts on. He's there a couple days a week, actually. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so um, this point in time count is really where the, we go and we count to see how many folks are actually homeless in West Virginia mm -hmm. and, and that and that so that we can address that need you know how prevalent is it here in west virginia and mm -hmm. in our area in our local area so so when you when you identify them do you then get out and try to get a name uh, do you just yes. count as you go by how do you do that yeah no we actually get a name ask them you know how long they've been homeless and there's a whole training uh, like a little training for the volunteers that will be going out to um uh, to do the count right so they'll you know that count starts january 24th let me make sure i have the correct date uh, it's 24th. It starts at 3 p.m. and ends the following day at 4. Or it starts at 4. It ends the following day at 4 in January. And, and the people, whole country does it. The uh, whole country. Are these for people who are not currently sheltered in, in like the Martinsburg Union Rescue Mission? Or is right. it for everybody? It's it's everybody. But, you know, yes, the mission, the Bethany House, the Women and Children's Shelter, um, the cold weather shelters that we have uh, in place, is, you know, in Jefferson County through JCCM, which is the Jefferson County Community Ministries, um, and uh, the um, Hope House, uh, I think that's in Morgan County, 
Uh, but they're, you know, we're definitely um, short on shelter for homeless folks. So, a lot, you know, I'm sure that many people have seen around town, you know, the folks asking for help, the tents off to the side out in the woods. Um, you know, as you're driving by, if you look to the left or right, when you go down, um, I guess that's Raleigh, the South Raleigh extension. Um, there's like a skate park there and back mm -hmm. there, there's a lot of folks there too behind the Coast Guard building there's a encampments out by the railroad tracks and so this count is super important and people can volunteer um, to, to do the point in time count um, you can go to the uh, West Virginia Coalition um, website which is wvceh.org slash -E pit C as in cat yeah okay yeah and that's coalition to end homelessness dot org slash pit and then they'll, that's where you can sign up if you'd like to volunteer. I know, yes. You mentioned those camps, and mm -hmm. your volunteers will go into those areas where you know there are homeless camps to right. make sure that you get that count of those people as well. Are, right. are they finding out in any way, or are you finding out um, even with, say, that someone that's on the corner of a road and you begin to talk to them, well, where are you staying? Are you finding more of the homeless camps around Berkeley County? Yes, absolutely. Um, you know, as a matter of fact, I was thinking about stopping and talking to that gentleman on the way out and just see, you know, um, because a lot of times at the shelters, you know, they have to exit the shelter um, at a certain time in the morning. I'm not sure what time that is. I think it's 730 in the morning, you know, like they'll get breakfast and then they have to exit the, the shelter. So, you know, if you were homeless and you don't have a car, what do you do? So you start walking around, trying to go in and out of places to stay warm. Um, oftentimes we see folks uh, camped out at laundromats because laundromats mm -hmm. are open 24-7 sometimes. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we'll go to the laundromats. Um, we'll go out behind the buildings, down railroad tracks. And so um, just to see, you know, a lot of times folks will figure out a way to stay somewhere, even with a friend for one night. Um, but, you know, the amount of homeless folks, I think, is much higher than what the count actually does actually count for um, because oftentimes people will hide sometimes they don't want to talk to you then yeah. yeah so that's what I was gonna ask mm -hmm. or do you get some reluctance to share their name and and when, when you're finding out who they are mm -hmm. do you is there a question there even of maybe what led to sure like what created this right. crisis and oftentimes you know it's loss of employment drug addiction mm -hmm. mental health um, or combination of all of that you know um, but really, I mean, the average person walking down the streets probably about four to five paychecks away from being homeless themselves. Mm -hmm. I mean, imagine if everything you had, your parents are gone, you don't have siblings, and now you've lost your job, you've lost your place to live. Now, how do you get back? How do you get back on your feet, right? And so, this point in time count helps to address that need to show that if we need more funding to help build more shelters or affordable housing. Um, it's all tied together, and what services do we really need? I, um, you know, as far as the um, mental health, you know, uh, that's a big one. That's oftentimes probably a, a big marker for folks that end up homeless, you know, especially if they have no more support anywhere, mm -hmm. um, mental illness. Mm -hmm. Maggie, mm -hmm. is the funding for Telemon state-driven or federal-driven? It's both. <clears throat> it's mostly, you know, we do grants. Now, uh, Telemon, we have um, our, our programs that are fa uh, the family housing mentors. They work with the uh, chronically homeless, and we get referrals from the West Virginia Coalition, which is state-driven. They send us folks, and basically they do an intake with, you know, and they have kind of, not I don't want to say a ranking system, but kind of, you know, where... Uh, Families who have been homeless longer are pretty much at the front of the line where folks that aren't. So, you know, this count is really important because we want to make sure that they get into the West Virginia Coalition's uh, intake, you know, uh, database because then that way we can go ahead and put them in so they can be uh, screened for housing, you know, rapid rehousing, which isn't really rapid right now. Um, you know, there's just such a lack of housing and uh, funding for to support these families that might need a little bit extra more, uh, wraparound care. Um, Where do you find affordable housing 
in the eastern panhandle where the cost of living for housing is so high compared to the rest of the state it's tough i I will say it is very tough and um, your first step would probably be to apply for uh, income-based housing um, section 8 at the martinsburg housing authority Um, they are you know the the amount of people that are needing this uh, is so overwhelming that those wait lists, they're pretty, pretty deep, you know, six months, section eight could be two years, three years. Um, but if you don't get in there, you're never going to get anywhere. You know, a lot of times people give up and they're like, well, it's going to take me eight months. Well, well, you've been homeless for eight months, get in, get on that list because eventually if you can survive that long, your name will come up and then you can get in. Um, but we definitely need to start looking at how we're going to address that because at the end of the day, you know, we still need folks that work at Sheets. We still need people to run Walmart. We still, and you know, even though those jobs are paying more, a lot of times families will, people will say, well, they're making $15 an hour. It's easy for us to say if we're making a more than 15, but imagine making 15 an hour and trying to pay a $900 a month rent, mm-hmm. your cell phone, if your If you gas. can find if $900 you can a find, month, right. Right, yeah. thank you. Mm-hmm. If you can find $900 a month rent, right. I mean, there's some private uh, property managers and landlords that have a little bit lower, but they're in high demand. And once folks get in, they really try to stay put, you know, because mm-hmm. if you're moving out, good luck, you're going to be on a wait list or you're going to be calling, calling, applying, applying, applying. And a lot of times folks don't have the extra funds to do all the application fees that come along with that. And those even have increased as well. Well, even if you have a decent income, Mm -hmm. trying to rent your first place is difficult Mm -hmm. because so many places you need the first month's rent, you need the last month's rent, you need a month's rent worth of deposit. So now you really need three months rent up front. You're looking at least Mm -hmm. $3,000. It's hard to get the one month rent up front for a lot of young young people. Right. And there are, uh, there really isn't any, um, funding right now uh, for any kind of assistance for security deposits or first month's rent. There really isn't. Um, it, and it's really sad because we have a lot of people and a lot of phone calls that come in of families. Hey, I just got my section. And this is one that really just crushes me is someone gets their section eight voucher, which, you know, they can pick wherever they want to live, you know, which is really nice. However, they have to pay regular fair market price for the security deposit and they can pay the prorated amount for the first month's rent. But these are families that are usually on disability or on SSI or are, um, you know, elderly who don't have the $1,200 up front. And so Mm -hmm. they'll ask for that. And, you know, we, we absolutely don't have that. And I don't know of any programs that are doing that at all. Maddie? At all. I tried, we try to help raise money through churches and stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, But if we did that, we'd be there round the clock trying to raise money for hundreds of families. Um, and the church is trying to raise money to keep itself going. Right, mm-hmm. exactly. So they can't really, they, they're just, they're pulled, they're spread mm-hmm. thin as well, uh, very much so. Um, just the increase in, in everything. So um, that point in time count is really important just so that we can at least say, hey, there is a need and this is what we need help with. What can mm-hmm. we do? What kind of, how can we come together to build affordable housing and how can we make um, it look, be attractive to developers, right? Yes. Because at the end of the day, you know, they're trying to make money as well, but building affordable housing isn't very profitable. So what are some things that can be done? Um, and those, you know, the point in time count, you know, address, kind of talks to that, you know, hey, we have, you know, 700 kids in Jefferson County that identify as homeless right now. Um, I think that was the number I was uh, given for 2023 or 22, for 2022, there was over 700 kids identified as um, school age kids, school age Mm -hmm. kids, yeah, Mm -hmm. enrolled, you know, where they're getting help through McKinney-Vento. So McKinney-Vento is a fund and is an act that passed that um, helps provide some funding for kids, you know, so if you, if you're homeless and you're staying at a hotel, let's say you're staying at motel eight whatever um you'll see the bus school bus go to the mm-hmm. motel to pick up the kids that's paid for through mckinney vento and that's a federal fund mm-hmm. that is provided to help these families to keep the kids that, going yeah. yeah it's it's really sad i was just in delaware last week 
and I uh, stayed at a, a Marriott hotel and it was nice, you know, they had a pool and everything. Um, but it kind of made me sad in the morning when I got up, uh, I went downstairs to get some breakfast and here came the school bus hmm. to pick up the kids, yeah. How many uh, homeless people do we have in the Eastern Panhandle, Maggie, from your last count? That, I don't have the figures for that, but I could certainly look that up for you. But I can tell you that um, is over 100 is over a hundred um and that's you know you when you think about the Mar martinsburg union rescue mission and you think about the bethany house and the families you know uh it's it's over a hundred it's over a hundred uh, and that's just berkeley county mm -hmm. <laughs> that's yeah. not counting the folks that are staying at the shelter at the cold weather shelter in jefferson county mm -hmm. the hope house in morgan county um so it and it's much higher than that because a lot of times folks don't want to tell you mm -hmm. that they're homeless, right. right? I mean, they're embarrassed or they're ashamed and and or they're fearful because they're like, well, I have kids and I don't want CPS to be called and mm -hmm. maybe they'll take my children away. So they'll not tell you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it, I think the problem is a lot bigger than we really realize right. that it is. It's got to be a fine line in someone's mind mm -hmm. where you, yeah, I want to help my kids mm -hmm. so I, I want to reach out for that help but right. I I'm fearful if I reach out for that help and they it, find out I'm homeless well then my kids might be taken and I'm what which one do I do do I reach out for help do I not and so right. uh, this this count I'm sure is uh, uh, very important what do you do with the count then once you know those numbers you've got names you have ideas at least where you might be able to contact these people what's the next step um, I'm not quite sure because this is mostly done through the um, West Virginia Coalition to End Homelessness. I, I imagine that they put together a report, they provide that to p apply for more federal funding right. to help with that and to help our homeless folks here in, Jeff in Berkeley, Jefferson, and Morgan County. Um, but it does also help to um, put together a plan of action on how we're going to address it. And I think that's that's the key part is we know there's a problem how big is that problem and what are some things that we can do together to help address that what are some services you know um, one of the things that i am very excited about for um, in jefferson county is apple tree gardens apartments has a family self-sufficiency program right now now they do income-based housing so your rent is based on your income right and um so one of the problems with that, and, and that works well, but oftentimes, let's say I'm working at Sheets and I'm making 15 an hour, and I get a raise and I'm making 16 now. That dollar raise uh, might put me out of being able to receive my $320 worth of SNAP benefits. Now, was that raise worth it? Not really, because the dollar raise isn't going to cover the 320 that I was getting to supplement my grocery bill. And everyone knows how much groceries are now. So it almost kind of keeps you from wanting to make more money because then you're, it kicks you out of all these other benefits. I might lose yeah. my health care. I might lose this. And then if I have to put the kids on my health care, then I, that's $700 out of my paycheck, you know, to cover health care. So it's this cycle. So yeah. what the Family Self-Sufficiency Program is doing right now is if you get, if you enroll in that program, then you would get, you would, you could escrow that, that raise, but your rent would stay the same, right? And so you can save money doing that. And then in the meantime, they also provide, um, some some training some uh, financial budgeting counseling which is what telemon is going to be doing for them we'll be t doing um, resume building and things like that to help them get better employed and so and then they can be in the program up to five years and i know recently they had a gal that because they did it in um, maryland in frederick maryland i believe and she was able to save twenty two thousand dollars and then exit that program improve her life she went to school she bought a house and so because the premise behind it is to get that get folks that's not a permanent solution income-based mm -hmm. housing it's a step up but it doesn't really do that unless they're able to like basically escrow that money into a savings as long as they're you know meeting their goals and setting goals and meeting with their coordinator um, and having a, other agencies like Telemon and like some other agencies to come in and provide some additional services to help improve their lives, right? So that they can become self-sufficient rather than 
well, this is where I'm at and I can't, I'm afraid to make more money because I'm not going to be able to afford it. Right. So we did, we did a segment on this, I don't know, a week or two ago with the West Virginia Center on Budget and Policy oh. in which they discussed the fact that if you're making up to 35,000, this roughly rounded mm -hmm. number, you're mm -hmm. eligible if, if you're, say, a, a single mom with a couple of kids, you're eligible for a variety of different programs and assistance. If you start making more than that, you start losing some of that income mm -hmm. assistance. So you almost have to jump from 35 to 75 exactly. to make it worth making more money. <laughs> exactly. It's almost like a disincentive to make more money. Right, right. And so I think that the self-sufficiency program is really the way to go because then it allows you to build on that and then actually exit instead of just and like that, you and said. And that's really what we want. Right. We want that exactly right. We want that so, so that it can open the door for another family that might be struggling, mm -hmm. who had some uh, back, uh, setbacks in the beginning, early in their life, and now they're trying to improve. So uh, they just recently enrolled a couple of folks at that program. So I'm really excited. Is that a case of unrealistic numbers, though? In other words, the 35000 that that has been set, when was that set? How many years ago? Why is it maybe set at that? And should there be a, a, a higher starting point? But then, as you say, maybe increments in there that you, you may lose a little something as you climb the ladder because now you can hopefully afford a few more things, but not like you say, a $40,000 almost jump that you would need to say, well, now I can live without all of that because I can afford all of the right. things that are coming my way. 100%. So is that the legislature that has to set that? I mean, where do those numbers kind of come from? It would. It would be probably is DHHR. The can can they make those decisions? Or yeah. right. I they assume would, it's a mix of federal have, and state. Right. And they would right? have to, you know, really build that case. Right. So, again, the point in time count these programs like the family self-sufficiency and looking at these outdated guidelines because you're right they are very outdated I, mm -hmm. they're probably from the 70s right. you know um and, and i'm not sure but you know they definitely don't meet what's happening right now right, right? right. and it does need to be revisited so really talking to our um our uh, representatives is really important and making folks aware that this is really what's happening. You know, a lot of times, you know, you hear, well, they just need to pull themselves up by their bootstraps. Well, yes, but that's easy for us to say we could play Monday morning quarterback and, and say, yeah, well, I would have done this. I would have done that. Um, but it doesn't always work out that way. You know, there's well, There are no bootstraps. You can't right. get a hold of anything. Right, right. right. So <laughs> We need to um, pass a law that everybody has a bootstrap attached. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm hoping to go to a conference in D.C. in April. Um, it, it's called Just Economy through NCRC, and um, they have Hill Day. Mm -hmm. So I want to kind of go where you get to go and talk to your representatives right, and right. just kind of report on what's going on and, uh, what are some of our concerns? And I'm definitely want to sign so, up for Hill Day and go talk to everybody. We have about a minute, minute left, yes. Maggie. Again, you might need some volunteers for this. Uh, right. Account, right. So, so go to www.westvirginia.org slash pit, which is point in time count pit and then you can it'll show you right where you can volunteer sign up to volunteer i know our our staff is going to be going out too uh if anybody has any more in detailed questions that they want to ask i would reach out to sabrina reese at uh, telemon uh, and her email is s reese r-e-e-s-e -E -E, at telemon.org and she can actually you know she's the actual point in time person count person for telemon and is the, the lead for this area so she she wasn't able to come in this morning but that's why i'm here it's, you're tough <laughs> oh <laughs> thank you you braved it all the way from winchester yes i did i was like yeah. i'm going there today <laughs> well done yeah. thank hey, you thanks Rob. matt good I to see you it was great seeing you it was good nice meeting you matt yeah. appreciate it thanks guys